Hi, I'm Paul Moniz of Albert Einstein College of Medicine. Thanks for joining us. On this segment of Einstein on stem cells, we're discussing stem cell research from just about every angle. We're going to explore some of the basics, including what a stem cell is and where it comes from, to delving into the details of the innovative and high-tech research being conducted at Einstein and other institutions to make stem cell therapies a future reality for conditions like liver failure, heart disease, cancer, and Parkinson's disease, just to name a few. Joining me to help navigate this topic is Dr. Paul Frenette. He's the new director of the Ruth L. and David S. Gottesman Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Research at Einstein. Dr. Frenette, who hails from Quebec, Canada, is an expert in blood stem cell research, vascular biology, and sickle cell anemia. Dr. Frenette, thanks a lot for being here. You know, most people have heard about the promise of stem cells, and I want to open our discussion with a really basic question, a definition. What are stem cells, and why are they so important? So, well, thanks, Paul. The, basically, the, a stem cell is the mother of all the cells of the body. So you can think of it, um, uh, you know, in the embryo, for example, it's the, it starts from basically a single cell that will then give rise to all the organs that the uh, fetus will have and the newborn will have. So these are naturally occurring cells. And when we speak about stem cells, it's important for our audience to understand that we're not just talking about one type of cell. There are actually several types of stem cells, each with its own unique properties and potential clinical applications. What are these stem cell categories? So, the, so the, what I just referred to really, it's what most people think about is actually is the, the embryonic stem cells, but you have also adult stem cells that are very important and actually clinically, uh, for example, blood stem cells, these are the cells that are used uh, that we have uh, most knowledge about and that we're using clinically to, uh, for therapies in bone marrow transplantation, for example. And you have some uh, fetal cells, the core blood cells are basically cells of the newborn that are uh, used also in, in the clinic. So these are very important, obviously, cells that have a lot of uh, uh, potential for, for therapy. The overarching goal is to turn stem cell research into stem cell therapies that can treat disease and improve the lives of patients. For which diseases do stem cell therapies hold the most promise? Yeah, that's uh, <laughs> always a difficult question to predict, but, uh, um, you know, obviously now, currently, uh, blood stem cells are used and, and for the treatment of cancers and for treatment of, of blood diseases, and that obviously will, will continue. In terms of, uh, you know, the embryonic stem cells, so the big promise that we hear a lot in the news, um, so there are uh, clinical trials that are beginning now, and the first trials of, of uh, studying are studying um, uh, spinal cord injuries, and so companies the FDA have, uh, has approved already a trial in this uh, in this uh, indication. But that doesn't mean that this will be really in ten years the an application that uh, stem cells will be used for. But there are other potential diseases. Diabetes, uh, for example, is a, is one that has promise. Here at Einstein, there's a lot of research being done in, in liver diseases and liver uh, regeneration, and that might be um, an interesting uh, disease application for the future. Uh, heart disease, there's a lot of clinical trials that will uh, begin in this area. And um, inflammatory, you have also uh, an inflammatory disease where you can use mesenchymal stem cell that can modify uh, the inflammatory response. So there's a number of, of potential uh, uh, application uh, for stem cell, uh, sometimes as replacement therapy, but also as, um, uh, as a disease modifying therapy. And that's is, this is for the cell therapy point of view, but there are many other applications also that don't deal with this. Uh, it's just in the lab, and uh, knowing how to differentiate cells and produce um, uh, synthetic organs. You can learn about, about disease uh, in, in the lab using stem cells. You can use also stem cells to, to screen for, for new drugs, perhaps much more efficiently that, uh, that other uh, methods of use. So wide applicability here. Let's talk about some of the mechanisms that allow stem cells to work. We've heard some scientists describe stem cells 
as pieces of clay that can be quote unquote molded into any cell in the human body. How do these blank cells, if you will, become differentiated? Yeah, that's a very good question. And if I knew the answer to this, uh, probably we would, you know, we would not be doing much <laughs> research right now. Uh, so that's a very complex issue. And obviously we're studying this and we're just beginning to understand how stem cells differentiate um, and understanding the factors, understanding the microenvironment that's important for, for that process to occur. And that's a critical question, obviously. And we're learning more and more, and it turns out that actually the, the, the ways we, we culture the cells may not be appropriate, and we're still learning what's the best way to do that, what's the best microenvironment that will mimic what we have in the body in vivo. Um, and so we're just beginning to understand this, and that's going to be critical to bring uh, cell therapy in patients if you want to do that. You're joining Einstein at an exciting time and a period of significant growth in our stem cell research capacity. Uh, since 2008, Einstein has received more than $15 million in stem cell funding from the New York State Stem Cell Science Initiative, or NYSTEM as it's known. And we have really a talented group of stem cell researchers already here, including Dr. Eric Bugacera, who's focusing on blood stem cells, Dr. Sanjeev Gupta, whose goal is to turn stem cells into fully functioning liver cells to potentially eliminate the need for liver transplants. You just alluded to that. Other notable Einstein stem cell researchers include Jayenta Roy Todardi and Ulrich Steidel. So you're coming in as the first director of this new institute. What is your vision for growth here? So we have, so it's fortunate because we have, with the goddess men, we had a, uh, a significant gift that will allow us to, to recruit uh, new stem cell researchers. Uh, and we have, the dean has been uh, wonderful and has allocated uh, space as well that will be dedicated for, for stem cell recruits in, in the Price Center, the new building at Einstein, but also in uh, three other buildings at, uh, at Einstein, the Kennedy Building, the Channon, and Ullman. So there'll be new recruits that will come in, and we're just bidding, beginning uh, that effort right now to, to uh, recruit uh, new people. We have advertised, and we're receiving applications, and we're, uh, we'll, we will evaluate applications with uh, the department chairs and other members of the Einstein community, of the uh, other members of, of the Institute. How large do you anticipate the Institute growing? Well, uh, we probably by uh, will increase in, um, investigators, num the number of inv investigators by a third, I think, I would anticipate in the next few years. That's exciting. Now, talking about recruitment, you were recruited here from Mount Sinai for a very specific reason, because of your expertise. And your work focuses on stem cell biology, vascular biology, and inflammation. And you've done some really innovative research on blood stem cell trafficking, which is examining how stem cells migrate between the bone marrow and blood. This led to the recognition of an correlation that was unknown before between the brain and bone marrow. Can you provide us with a better understanding of why stem cell trafficking is so critical to this field moving forward? Uh, yes, yeah, so we don't really know why uh, blood stem cells actually traffic under steady state condition. That's, that's quite an interesting phenomenon. But the, we've used this, hematologists have, have used this to, to harvest stem cells. So you can mobilize them from the bone marrow into the blood uh, using specific uh, agonists, agents. And uh, so we've, one interest of the lab is to, to try to understand the mechanisms by which this occurs. And we, uh, through a series of, of investigation, have found that actually neural signals uh, from the uh, sympathetic nervous system in particular, so the, the part of the nervous system that, that uh, mediates the, the uh, flight and fight responses, uh, is involved in regulating the trafficking of, of uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So we found in particular that there is a release that really follows uh, a circadian pattern. So you have uh, changes in the number of stem cells during the day uh, and night, so big differences. 
and we've you know we've studied the mechanisms and this has led us to also study more specifically the microenvironment where it's regulated in what we call the stem cell niche which is really the local environment that regulates how stem cell traffic but also how stem cell remain a stem cell undifferentiated or start to differentiate it so this is uh, an area that so if you can understand this micro environment around the stem cell this niche what does that do for you scientifically well that will uh, i think uh, tell us a, uh, a lot of things about how stem cells uh, work how they self-renew how they differentiate but also uh, ultimately when we talk about um, therapies and one of the at least one holy grail in in hematopoietic stem cell is to be able to expand uh, hematopoietic stem cell in vitro and this has been very very challenging um, a lot of people have worked on this and it, it hasn't been very very successful so far and maybe one of the reasons is that we don't really understand the niche we don't really understand the, the uh, in vivo uh, microenvironment and so uh, if we were able to reproduce this microenvironment in vitro in the, in the dish, um, it would be, I think this would allow us to expand potentially stem cells. You touched on something important, which is that these stem cells behave differently in a living body, so to speak, than they do in a lab dish. And that's an important distinction. Uh, why do you think there's such a difference in behavior? Well, this is known for many cells. So this um, this emphasizes the role of, of the microenvironment, the, uh, the tissue environment. So there's a crosstalk between stem cells and other cells, or other differentiated cells, and sometimes other stem cells. We've just shown, for example, in the bone marrow, you have crosstalk between the mesenchymal stem cell, which is a tissue stem cell, and the blood stem cell, and these two stem cells uh, actually form a, a niche in the bone marrow. And other differentiated cells, I'm sure, also cross talk with stem cells, and that's important in their regulation. So when you take, when you isolate a cell, you put it in a petri dish, obviously the cell is kind of, it's isolated. It's so on its, its own island, so to speak. Yes, so it doesn't behave the same. So cells are, um, live in, in uh, live in, in, in communities so it's it's uh, it's very different uh, that's one of the reasons why when you culture cells they don't behave the same way so dr. Fournette, let's talk about other applications for stem cells that might not be immediately obvious people hear about stem cell therapies and think go about going to a hospital and getting an infusion but really there's a lot to be learned from stem cells in terms of using them to build diseased tissue. Can you explain how this process works and why it's so important? So this is part of stem cell, understanding stem cell differentiation. And ultimately, with the help, I think, and I'm very excited about bioengineering uh, approaches in stem cell biology, is that one would be able to direct stem cells to differentiate in a situation that really resembles the, the uh, in vivo um, uh, uh, parameters, and if we if we're able to do that properly, I think we could uh, theoretically in vitro uh, allow stem cells to differentiate and then transplant these these uh, these cells back in uh, patients. So um, I think the there's some examples, emerging examples of that now in 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 the coming literature. And that's, uh, that's an area, I think, uh, that will grow in the future. Can you give us some examples of the kinds of diseased tissues that might be generated this way and then how drugs could be targeted against them? Well, the liver is one of them. You know, if you, so people are, grown, uh, are growing liver cells in bioreactors. And there's been a lot of research in this area. Uh, there was just a paper published recently about uh, joints and you know people using a bio scaffold to to uh, to reconstitute a joint in in the rabbit. So you can think about these potential applications in in people too in the future. Um, again, I come back, if I come back to blood stem cells, it's the same thing. People have used bioreactor to try to to expand them, but it hasn't been very successful so far. 
We hear so much these days about the promise of stem cell therapy. The media have widely covered stem cell research. From a practical point of view, though, where are we? How much stem cell therapy right now is being practiced on patients and in what areas? Well, it's basically limited right now to uh, hematopoietic stem cells. So the blood stem cells. The blood stem cells. And uh, so this is, is, is working well. It's been done for the past uh, you know, few decades. Uh, but it's fairly recent uh, that uh, you know, it's not something that uh, it's 100 years. It's uh, you know, three decades or so. And under what circumstances would these stem cells be used for? What kinds of conditions? So mostly it's uh, cancers. So people uh, that have cancer that uh, uh, receive chemotherapy, and um, the chemotherapy is, is, is so strong that it basically will wipe out uh, the stem cell of the, of the, the patient. So you need to uh, infuse uh, um, back, either backup cells that come from the same patient or that come from a donor. We call that allogeneic donor, because usually it's a brother or a related donor. But you can also use unrelated donor, and that's where core blood, uh, uh, core blood cells come into play. Uh, one can use core blood cells because they're fetal. They don't react immunologically as much as adult cells. So you can give these cells to to unrelated uh, people uh, with uh, pretty good success. And in terms of the toxicity of the chemotherapy drugs, what you're suggesting is some of them, for a sustained period of time, can be so toxic that they could potentially uh, cause significant uh, morbidity or even mortality to the patient. Is that right? Yes, it's a it's question of dose. So some, in some protocols, the doses are such that uh, they, they basically would kill if you don't transplant uh, stem cells. So um, I mean, that, that there are protocols for this. So the idea is that you give very strong doses of chemotherapy to basically kill the cancer. And at the same time, there are side effects on normal stem cells. And that's why you, can, you need to replenish with, with fresh stem cells. As most people are aware by now, stem cell research uh, is controversial, at least certain kinds of it, especially research that uses embryonic stem cells. On August 23rd of this year, a U.S. district judge issued an order that halted research using stem cells from embryos. The case is currently, as of September, before the U.S. Court of Appeals. How concerned are you, Dr. Fournette, about the ramifications of this action? Yeah, that's a, that's a very... Uh disconcerting uh, uh, court order and and so it's not I'm, I'm very concerned and and there's a few investigators actually at Einstein that are directly affected by this uh, with their grants so it's really unclear what's going to happen and what's really uh, worrisome is that uh, the politics are getting into the research and and will be directing what researchers are supposed to be doing. So there have been, so we thought a few years back that that the, um, or some of the issues, the controversies of, of working with embryonic stem cells were resolved, but then we're back to square one. We don't know uh, if we can use even uh, cell lines that were approved uh, uh, in, under the Bush administration. So that's really uh, a major, um, a major concern, and 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 you know the sad part of this is I think it's not going to go away because the politicians will probably come back. You know, it, I'm sure it will be resolved in the short term, but in the long term, it 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 might come back. So we have to find long term solutions. We've talked with many researchers about stem cell therapies over the past year, including many here at Einstein, and there's a sense that the public may actually have unrealistic expectations on the speed with which stem cell therapies can safely get to patients with regularity, and really an underappreciation of the complexity and some of the risks involved. So first, how long will it be, do you think, before you're the average patient can go to a hospital and receive stem cell therapies for common conditions like diabetes or sickle cell anemia or even heart disease. Any uh, responsible timetable that you can throw out? 
Well, the good news is for sickle cell anemia, actually, it's, it's happening now. So that, that's a disease that, that uh, is currently treated with, with blood stem cells. So you can replace um, the, uh, all the blood compartment from sickle cell patient, which is a blood disease, with fresh uh, stem cells. So that, that works. Now, diabetes and heart disease, um, that's not yet there. Um, you know, diabetes might be achievable because, uh, fairly rapidly, because it's, it's only a defect of, a larger defect of insulin, uh, which uh, could be corrected with not that many cells. So that's probably achievable, and there's been a lot of interesting progress about, about reprogramming of cells, uh, which would prevent um, the use of, of uh, stem cells from another donor. In other words, you, know, you could reprogram the patient's own cells and to make them uh, produce insulin, and that uh, you know, would, would avoid problems uh, of immune rejection, which is a major issue for, for in stem cell therapy. So, but you know, there's a lot of work to be to to do to to before these cells, reprogrammed cells, can be used for for treatment of patients. We have to understand these cells uh, uh, much better than we do now, and that's going to take some time. And that's where the lead time is. So it's happening, but there's uh, we it's going to take some time, and we have to do it uh, the proper way and and. Um, Otherwise, we'll have setbacks, and these setbacks, I think, are very dangerous, so we better do it right. What are some of the risks associated with stem cell therapies and this reason why science really needs to proceed in a steady but measured course? So I alluded to uh, the immune rejection, so that's a, that's a major risk when you use cells that don't come from your own body. Um, so that's, that's a major issue. Uh, so you need to control this. And again, with the hematopoietic stem cell, we, we understand this, or even with uh, um, you know, organ grafting, we, we understand uh, uh, immune rejection, but um, not completely. And so that's certainly a, a risk, and it's a major hurdle. And another major one, if you think about uh, embryonic stem cells or stem cell derived from embryonic stem cell, is, is the potential of these cells to, to form tumors. So it's known that embryonic stem cells can form tumor. So when you derive tissue stem cells from them, there's always a risk that there will be some cells that are undifferentiated, that if injected into a human body, could form a tumor. So, so that's why we really need to understand how to differentiate them in, in a very high level of purity to avoid that, that problem. So what's needed here to move things forward? Um, I would imagine robust protocols would be critical. Exactly, exactly. So that's robust protocols um, that uh, give uh, reproducible uh, uh, differentiation uh, patterns and, and clinical trials. Uh, to test the safety of, of these cells uh, in people. In closing, Dr. Fernand, we're both in our 40s. Um, do you think that we'll see stem cell therapy become a mainstay of medical treatments uh, in our lifetime? And, and where do you feel this field in general is headed? <laughs> well, I, I hope so. I certainly hope so. I think uh, um, there's, there's a lot of work to do uh, we already we see a tremendous we've seen a tremendous progress in the past few years, um, and so we will see clearly impact of, of stem cell research in in our lives, and it may not be uh, you know initially as cell replacement therapy, but there'll be uh, uh, impacts on on disease in helping finding new drugs in helping understanding disease better with a better model. Um, and I'm sure there'll be a lot of, uh, of, uh, of uh, contribution and, and uh, from, from stem cell research. But this is not a sprint. 
It's definitely not. So it's going to take uh, it's going to take a long time before um, we uh, understand um, how stem cell work. And uh, as I said before, there'll be setbacks. So we have to be ready. Uh, we have to persevere to move forward and try to bring this to the clinic as soon as possible. Fascinating insights. Dr. Fernet, thank you for joining us and welcome to Einstein. Certainly thank a promising you. field and a lot of hard work ahead. We've been speaking with Dr. Paul Fernet, the new director of the Ruth L. and David S. Gottesman Institute for Stem Cell and Regenerative Medicine Research at Einstein. I'm Paul Moniz. Thanks for tuning in to Einstein on Stem Cells. We encourage you to visit our website at einstein.yu.edu for more science and medical news.